a positive test does not necessarily mean that you're allergic. There are many false positives with food testing, both in skin and blood testing. And the reasons for that are numerous, but one of them is that the immune system is very complicated. So just because your immune system pays attention to a food or you're sensitized to a food does not mean that you'll react to a food because there's so many other pieces in play there. So in the absence of a convincing reaction history, you are not allergic until proven otherwise. And that being said, if a patient has had symptoms with a food, but a screening test was negative afterwards, not like I tell families to go home and just try the food without me. We talk about trying it with me, looking for possible other culprits, et cetera. But in food allergy, history trumps everything. Hey, y'all. I'm so excited to have on our show today one of my good friends and my colleague and the Associate Director of the Cleveland Clinic Food Allergy Center of Excellence, Dr. Jackie Bajelic. We're going to talk about food challenges, and we're actually going to go through a case that one of my listeners sent in. So let's dive right in. Welcome to Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with Dr. Alice Hoyt the podcast about demystifying food allergies, diminishing allergy anxiety, and taking back control. Let's navigate this challenge together with evidence-based information, scientific research, and tried and proven practices. And now, here's your host, board-certified allergist and immunologist specializing in food allergy, Dr. Alice Hoyt. Dr. Bajelic, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Dr. Hoyt. Absolutely. And let's dive right in. So many of my listeners have been asking me about food challenges, about food testing. Um, But actually, before we get into that, I would really like to know from you, how did you get so interested in and so passionate about food allergy? Yeah. Um, So really, my particular interest in food allergy came out more in my fellowship. I think a lot of allergists go into fellowship with a pretty clear career path Um, that ended up not being the case for me. And really, it was as I met so many patients and families who were dealing with food allergy, I realized what an amazing opportunity it was to improve quality of life. And also, it's just a really exciting time to be an allergist in food allergy. We're making a lot of really important strides in prevention and treatment. And I really was drawn to sort of the idea that like, this just wasn't good enough. And that's something I wanted to be a part of. Very nice. Very nice. And yeah, in the last few years, there's been so much change Mm -hmm. when it comes to food allergy. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that. What... What do you think has been one of, been one of the biggest changes that we've seen um, in the food allergy landscape? So really with the learning early about peanut trial that came out while I was in fellowship, I think that really dramatically shifted how we introduce potentially allergenic foods to children in the United States. You said learning early about peanut, the LEAP study. The LEAP study. So You know, previously there had been recommendations based on what we believed to be best at the time, of course, to delay introduction of allergenic foods, particularly peanut. And with the results of that study, it became abundantly clear that we were wrong. And so now we have an opportunity to, with simple food, prevent food allergy, just with timing of introduction. And I think that's one of the most exciting fields in food allergy. And you know, the data are the most robust for peanut, but that's been shown also with egg. And importantly, we just extrapolate it to the other potentially allergenic foods so that these kids have an expanded diet. They're not as restricted. Hopefully families aren't as nervous to give those foods early in life. So just from a practical standpoint, that study was really pivotal. Absolutely. And what we're going to talk about today is um, I have an email from a listener, actually, that I'll read to you, and we'll go through that and and sort of um, break it down step by step. But it certainly includes the themes that are in the learning early about peanut and what to do if a kiddo 
um, is at risk or in this case is not necessarily at risk of peanut allergy. Mm-hmm. So, so let's dive right in to this email that I received. Um, the mama says, I'll be taking my son for a peanut food challenge in a couple of weeks. He was not considered high risk. He reacted at home, then had a positive skin and blood test. And again, high risk. Um, and he will almost, he'll be almost nine months old at the challenge. So when this mama is saying that he was not at high risk, that means that her little sweet pea did not have ag allergy, nor, uh, did he have, Um, severe eczema. So this is a little kiddo, doesn't have egg allergy, doesn't have eczema. He reacted to peanut at home. I'm sorry, doesn't have severe eczema. He reacted to peanut at home um, and then saw the allergist and had a positive skin test and a positive blood test. She's asking, can you talk a little bit about what to expect with the food challenge in a baby this young? She also asks, what about nursing? I read an article that said that the kiddo should eat two hours before the challenge. He's still nursing every three hours, and I feel um, that not feeding him right before or during will lead to issues that could be hard to differentiate from a reaction to the peanut butter. She does say that she talked to her allergist um, front office staff, and she's waiting to hear back from her allergist because, as my listeners know, I am an allergist, but I'm not their allergist. Same with you, Dr. Bajelic. You are an allergist, an amazing allergist, but you're not our listener's allergist. But let's dive into this. Mm-hmm. Um, and where where do you want to start with it? Let's just go through it. Yeah, so I think maybe it makes sense to talk about diagnosis of food allergy, because that sounds like what this allergist is going for. And I'm really glad that this child's undergoing a food challenge because, you know, without knowing what the symptoms were that were concerning for a peanut allergy, sounds like maybe there may have been some very mild or questionable symptoms for whatever reason. In the setting of positive testing, which only indicates sensitivity, the lack of a convincing reaction history does not diagnose food allergy, right? So, We pursue physician-supervised oral food challenges to diagnose food allergy because we don't lightly take just diagnosing kids with food allergy. That's a label that we really want to make sure needs to be there. Let's let's camp on that for uh, at least a minute because this is something that is not very well known. A lot of people think that, oh, if I have a positive skin test, if I have a positive blood test, then I am allergic. And you and I know, because we're food allergists, that that is not the case. Having a positive skin test and or a positive blood test, if that's all that I know right now, all that means is that person is sensitized. It's that clinical reaction history that really determines whether or not the kiddo is allergic. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I tell people, if you're eating a food, there's no test in the world that would convince me that you're allergic to it. And just because you have a positive test, if you've never eaten the food, you very well might not be allergic. Allergy testing is unfortunately imperfect. And there are many people who come to us with a positive test, for example, who have been enjoying a food or their child's been enjoying a food with absolutely no symptoms. And then they're concerned that this positive test means that they're allergic. And I tell those people, if you're eating a food with no symptoms, there is no test in the world that would convince me that you are allergic. And then, you know, hopefully everybody is very relieved and the kid can still enjoy the food and it's great. Along those same lines, in a child who's never ingested a food, a positive test does not necessarily mean that you're allergic. There are many false positives with food testing, both in skin and blood testing. And the reasons for that are numerous, but one of them is that the immune system is very complicated. So just because your immune system pays attention to a food or you're sensitized to a food does not mean that you'll react to a food because there's so many other pieces in play there. So in the absence of a convincing reaction history, you are not allergic until proven otherwise. 
And that being said, if a patient has had symptoms with a food, but a screening test was negative afterwards, not like I tell families to go home and just try the food without me. We talk about trying it with me, looking for possible other culprits, et cetera. But in food allergy, history trumps everything. Very often, we need to do a food challenge in the office so that in a very safe way, we can diagnose food allergy or hopefully diagnose tolerance to the food in question. That's exactly right. And I I try to have people think about, does a kiddo tolerate a food or do they not tolerate a food? And then from there, let's try to figure out, is it an allergic reaction to a food that they were having with those symptoms? Or is it a reaction, but not necessarily an allergic reaction? Lactose intolerance means that you don't tolerate a food, but it's not an allergic reaction. It is an intolerance that has to do with not having enough of an enzyme in your gut. So very, very different from food allergy. Mm -hmm. So let's continue with this mama's question because I already kind of pointed out that this little kiddo who's under one year of age was not at high risk, meaning the kiddo didn't have egg allergy and didn't have severe eczema. We also talked about skin testing and blood testing and how even though they test for allergic antibodies and Listeners, if you're new to the show, then you can certainly go into the Food Allergy and Your Kiddo info blog and check out more information, really more in the weeds about some of this. And we will do more um, podcasting about the differences between blood testing and skin testing because it can get pretty complicated. But let's now sort of dive into what the kiddo can expect and what the mama can expect when they are going in for this challenge. So Jackie, you and I practice together. We practice pretty similarly. Um, What's sort of your spiel when you are talking to a food allergy mama or papa about bringing the kiddo in? Okay, the kiddo has that history. The kiddo has the positive testing. Now, let's see, is this really an allergy or let's let's rule out allergy? And the way we're going to do that is with a food challenge. What do you tell the parents? Yeah, I think this is a really, really important question. And every allergist is going to have some stylistic preferences and every office might be a little different. But what to expect when you come into our office at the clinic is, you know, we ask that you typically bring a child who will hopefully readily eat food. So we usually tell families, you know, a lighter breakfast or a light meal. So along the lines of mom's breastfeeding question, certainly she can nurse her child because a hungry child is not going to be a happy child. So they're not going to cooperate. And then an upset child could be upset because they're hangry or because they're reacting. So it's definitely, we want the child to come in feeling hungry-ish, like they're going to eat doses, but not upset because they're super hungry. (laughs) Is hangry a medical term? (laughs) I believe so. I believe that's very official and medical and probably in the New England Journal somewhere. So, but everybody knows what I mean. So so we have them bring their child. And in addition to, you know, being in a good state from a hunger standpoint, we always ask that the child come in feeling well. So a child who has a ton of cold symptoms or whose asthma isn't under good control or whose eczema's flared up totally out of control is not a good candidate for a food challenge for a couple of different reasons. One being any new symptoms during a food challenge or worsening of those symptoms, it would be really hard to interpret then if a runny nose is because of the cold or is it because they're reacting to the food. And second of all, particularly in the setting of uncontrolled asthma, if the child were to have a reaction, that's potentially much more dangerous for the child if their asthma is not well controlled. So we really want a child who's feeling overall well and who's not hangry, which is the official medical term, (laughs) to come in for a food challenge. And then when you arrive for the food challenge, the expectation should be that you're seen by your provider. You get a full physical exam, and we would talk quite a bit before the challenge starts. The nurses take a full set of vitals. 
at the Cleveland Clinic, you have to sign a permission slip before we do a food challenge that says that we talked about any potential risks and that you have the chance to ask questions. And then the food challenge itself is not particularly complicated. Depending on the food and the allergist and the potential history of reaction, you can expect anywhere from four to probably six doses for a challenge that's looking at anaphylactic potential to foods. We start with an infinitesimally small amount of the food in question and wait for a period of time, typically about 15 minutes, but again, that can be prolonged for allergist preference or history, et cetera. And then we give them a little bit more and wait 15 minutes. And then we give them a little bit more and wait 15 minutes. And the idea is to get to the end where your child has had an age-appropriate serving of the food. Your child's monitored very closely. You should expect to be checked on frequently by the nursing staff and the provider. And it's important that any change in your child's condition, anything you feel is different, you immediately bring to the medical team's attention. The whole point of doing a food allergy challenge in the office is so any symptoms can be promptly treated in a safe way. And you can talk to your allergist about what symptoms they would be looking for in particular, but it's any symptoms of an allergic reaction or anything that changes from when your child comes in. And then additionally, to talk to the allergist about what medications they use. Some allergists for mild symptoms use antihistamines, but as we know, epinephrine is the treatment for anaphylaxis. So talking to your allergist about how likely it is that they may use epinephrine is really important. One thing I tell all of my patients, particularly in young kids who are not able to articulate as well, like, yes, I'm definitely starting to feel a little better, or no, I think maybe my throat feels a little more full. I'm very aggressive with epinephrine, and I tell them that so that they know that it's not unusual for me to treat a reaction with epinephrine at all. Because I think that, you know, when your child's not feeling well and they're about to get an epinephrine injection, that that can be alarming for families. So we always kind of talk about what it looks like when we treat a reaction. So ideally, a child would get through the challenge with no symptoms. And there's typically a prolonged observation period after the last dose Because the worst thing is if you get in the car and then your child throws up everywhere and then you have to go right back in. So depending on the food and the reaction history, we watch for a minimum of an hour, typically two or three hours after the food is totally completed. And then depending on the outcome of the challenge, whatever it may be, you should expect that your provider would then sit down with you and talk about next steps whether it be if there's no symptoms, how often to include the food in the diet, etc. Versus if there were symptoms, what do we do next? What are the options moving forward? In this particular age group, there are a few different ways that a peanut challenge can be done. The the one absolute no-no way is to give a young baby a peanut. So a lot of times when people think, wait, these allergists are telling people to introduce peanut into babies' diets, but peanuts are choking hazards. So we never mean an actual peanut in its nut form. But there are ways that babies, um, even children as young as four months um, who are at high risk of developing peanut allergy can actually have peanut protein introduced to their diet safely. So I'm a big fan of diluting peanut butter, um, meaning mixing a smooth, creamy peanut butter with a safe water, a bottled water, a nursery water, typically like a one-to-one mixture, or maybe a little bit more water. Dr. Bajalik, what are some ways that you like to do these early peanut challenges? There's really nice um, guidelines from the NIAID in doing these introductions And listeners, a link to those recommendations can be found in this episode's info blog. And in addition to smooth, diluted peanut butter, which was both of my children's second food, (laughs) we um, can also use peanut flowers. 
There are bomba snacks, which have sort of the texture of Cheetos. And for very young children, they can be soaked in liquid to soften them further. And those tend to be the preferred ways for very young kids. As kids get a little bit older, I'm totally shameless. So peanut M&Ms, Reese's peanut butter cups, whatever appeals to the child from a texture and taste standpoint, as long as it's safe to consume for their age. Now, we've been talking about food challenges for kiddos who have anaphylactic or IgE-mediated food allergies. We're not talking about F-Pies. We'll talk about F-Pies in a different episode. But talking about symptoms of anaphylaxis, including those very early symptoms, how do you describe what you're looking for when you're doing a food challenge? Yeah, so when we're talking about anaphylactic potential, Nearly always, these symptoms start very soon after a child's eaten the food, typically within minutes. Anything after two hours would be very rare. Things that we're looking for are changes in the skin that can be flushing or visible discrete hives. Along that same spectrum is swelling, you know, swelling of the lips or tongue. Children may have an upset stomach, complain that their stomach hurts. We often see vomiting as part of these allergic reactions. Very rarely, but it does happen in anaphylaxis. You can also have diarrhea. And then you can also have things that involve the respiratory tract. So stuffy, drippy nose, coughing, feeling short of breath, just kind of feeling like it's hard to breathe. In very severe reactions, sometimes children experience a sensation, we call it impending doom. They get very scared and they say things like, I really need somebody to help me. Like they sort of are kind of tuned into how sick they are. And very rarely, thankfully, Children could actually lose consciousness if their blood pressure were to drop considerably. And thankfully, very rarely, but of course, the thing that as providers and parents and patients are always concerned about would potentially be death, which is virtually unheard of in a physician-supervised food challenge. Dr. Bajelic, what last tidbits would you give to this mama who is clearly doing all the right things? What what last tidbits of love would you give to her? Honestly, I would just say pat yourself on the back because it's hard to do this. It's hard to navigate feeding your child. It's hard to navigate when your child has symptoms that you're worried could be an allergic reaction. It's really hard when there's an allergist giving you information to kind of interpret it and filter it and make decisions that you think are the best for your child, but you're doing an amazing job advocating for your kid. And it sounds like you found a good allergist who in the question of a food allergy is moving forward with a food challenge because this diagnosis is extremely important. We have seen and continue to see some allergists who, particularly in the setting of robustly positive testing, will simply label a child with a food allergy. And we're learning more and more that that's just not the right thing to do. So I'm really excited for you that it sounds like you found a great progressive allergist who can help you navigate this journey no matter what the outcome of the challenge is. And one thing that we're really passionate about in our practice is early peanut oral immunotherapy. So even if this little kiddo has a positive challenge, that's not necessarily the end of the story, right? No, absolutely. So while not the right choice for everyone, one thing to discuss with your allergist after a challenge is, is my child a good candidate for a desensitization treatment option. Depending on your age of the child and the food in question, there actually might be a couple of different options, particularly for peanut. So in young children, we think of their immune systems kind of like puppies. They're very eager and willing to be retrained. That's a great comparison. As opposed to the older you get, food allergy desensitization treatments do get a little harder. 
the young children who do desensitization treatments for peanut, we call it early peanut oral immunotherapy, tend to do beautifully. And I won't get into too much detail because I'm sure we could just do a whole nother podcast on OIT. But suffice to say that if you have a young child who's diagnosed with a peanut allergy, talk to your allergist about the potential for using peanut oral immunotherapy as one, a level of protection against accidental ingestions, and two, to hopefully help the immune system outgrow the peanut allergy to the point where your child may be able to eat peanut on a regular basis, even without taking a dose every day, something that we call sustained unresponsiveness, which we see very high rates of in this age group because of the flexibility of their immune systems. That is such good information. Well, Dr. Bajelic, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on with our audience today? No, I think that it was wonderful that we got to kind of work through that email and touch on so many different areas. But it's really important that if you have questions or concerns about your child, to reach out to your allergist. Sometimes we forget what we know, and what seems abundantly clear to your allergist might be very confusing or very unclear to you. And you should really feel empowered on this journey of navigating food allergy in your child, because it can be, you know, a place with a lot of question marks and uncertainties, and you should feel like you have a good partner in that journey. Absolutely. Dr. Majelic, thank you so much for coming on the Food Allergy and Your Kiddo podcast today. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Isn't she fantastic, y'all? I am blessed to have such wonderful friends and colleagues. And if you have questions about what Dr. Bajalik and I talked about today, visit foodallergyandyourkiddo.com. Send us your questions. As you heard during this episode, I want to get your questions answered. Um, So remember, I am an allergist, but I'm not your allergist. So use the information that you learned from this episode and talk with your allergist about how this food allergy information may affect you or your kiddo. And especially during this time of back to school, God bless you and God bless your family. Thanks for listening to this episode of Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with food allergist, Dr. Alice Hoyt. For more information on navigating the world of food allergy, visit www.foodallergyandyourkiddo.com and follow Dr. Hoyt on Twitter at Dr. Alice Hoyt. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Let's take the anxiety and confusion out of food allergy.